Okay, so my name is Chief Warrant Officer 3, Charles Wheeler. Um, like Steve said, I've been in the Army for a while. I've been a welder since the first day. Um, so has anybody here ever been in the military, Army, Navy? Army. You're in the Army, active duty, or? Yes. What was your MO? 11 Charlie. 11 Charlie. Man, all right. And probably before you were born. Probably so. <laughs> All right, so I want to start out this presentation with this picture right here. Um, it's a picture of a picture of a picture kind of thing, but that is a, it's a picture of a painting that hangs in the Ordnance Corps Museum, all right? Um, I don't know if y'all can read it, but at the bottom it says, GI Welder by somebody, uh, Camp Huckstep, Egypt, World War II. Okay, so a lot of people don't really know that the military, maybe they know the Navy has welders because it's a ship that's made out of metal, all right? But a lot of people don't really know that the Army the Marines and the Air Force have a lot of welders as well. So this picture, uh, it really illustrates the, the history that we have um, in the Army and uh, in the Ordnance Corps. So right off the bat, I'll just let you know that this goofy symbol right here is the, uh, it's the warrant officer symbol. I'm a warrant officer, so I put that everywhere I go. And then over here, Ordnance Corps. Um, the Ordnance Corps is one of the, it's one of the branches, um, kind of like the infantry or something like that. Um, it's the oldest branch in the Army, um, and so we're very proud of the Ordnance Corps. And then down here, that's just my rank. In case you don't know what it is, that's what it looks like when I'm wearing my uniform. All right, so here's a quick agenda. Who am I? I'm going to let you know. I'm going to kind of talk about what it takes to get in the Army. Um, and then I'm going to talk about 91 Echo, which is the, the job of being a welder. That's, that's the title for it. Uh, what do they do, some of the opportunities while you're in the Army, and when they get out. Um, first thing I'd like to say is, when I was first approached about doing this, I didn't really know what to say, what I was going to put on here, you know, just, you know, whatever. So, but as I thought about it, it's something that's really important to me, because each of you is an educator of welders in some respect, okay? Um, so, if you have a kid or a young adult, whatever we call them, um, that, that maybe wants to come in the military or something like that and pursue a welding career, I will tell you that it can be difficult, but it's, it's a great experience. All right, and so if, if just one or two people um, from any of your schools um, join the Army and come in and become a 91 Echo, um, and I help facilitate that, then it's my pleasure to do that. So this, is, this presentation is very important to me. All right, first off, I'm not a recruiter, okay? Um, it's important for me to say that for the simple fact of recruiters kind of have the, the reputation of being liars. You know, they, they say things, I don't think they really lie, but they don't really tell the whole truth. If you ask me a question, which I hope you ask me a lot of questions, um, I'm gonna tell you the truth as I see it, the way I, I, I've been doing things. Um, I've been supervising hundreds of soldiers in this field. So I will tell you the absolute truth, all right? I won't, I won't tell you some sort of falsehood or some, some half truth or something like that. Um, I'm an active duty chief warrant officer. Um, I'm not a reservist. I can speak to some of that. I was in the reserves for a couple of years. Um, National Guard, similar to the reserves, I can speak a little bit to that if, if you have a question about that. Um, so what are warrant officers? Warrant officers are sub, sub, subject matter experts in their field. So basically, in the Army, um, if you're very skilled, you can become a warrant officer. Instead of doing admin stuff, you stay doing that one thing that you do. For me, it's Allied Trades Warrant Officer. Uh, there's something like 60 MOSs for warrant officers. There's you know IT technicians. And there's there's people who know everything about weapons and, and different fields, but but they're subject matter experts in whatever that job is. Um, so again, I'm a 914 Alpha. That's my MOS title, Allied Trades Warrant Officer. Um, oh yeah, and warrant officers, we're very small. We're less than 1% of the total Army population. Over half of them are pilots, all right? So uh, over half of us. So most, of, most warrant officers are pilots. Uh, basically what I do in a nutshell, manage welding shops, all right? Whether it's, you know, out in the field, whether it's in, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq or, or at Fort Hood or you know, wherever you're at. Um, again, we're small. There's, there's about 
one 914 Alpha in any brigade combat team. Uh, right now there's something like 15 BCPs, um, and then there's other types of units as well. But the, the majority of people that come in the Army, they're going to end up in a BCP, uh, a brigade combat team. So in that BCP, there's going to be one of me in that entire brigade, which is about 5,000 people. All right, so sometimes it can be a, a pretty good job. Uh, low density field for 914, there's about 80 of us on active duty. There's actually more in the National Guard or Reserve. But again, we're small, you know. <laughs> Those are the ranks up there. All right, so to get in the Army, find a recruiter. That's the first thing you have to do, okay? So if you have someone that wants to go in the Army, I can say whatever I want right here. It doesn't matter. They need to go find a recruiter, all right? I can't help you with that. I, they tried to put me on recruiting one time, and I worked diligently to get out of it because I would be a terrible recruiter. Um, so basically, you know, if you have someone that wants to possibly come in the military, they got to have good moral character. That's kind of one of the things that has to happen. Um, in the last year, slipped a little bit, and uh, that's done now. Um, we've actually started kicking people out of the Army for law violations that they were waivered for when they came in the Army. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about the drawdown and everything. Um, so absolutely. I will say some things are waverable and it could possibly be just fine. That's for that recruiter to deal with, okay? If they have some kind of major violation, you know, a, a lot of times assault or something like that, it's not gonna happen, they're not gonna let you go. The Army tattoo policy has become a huge deal in the last couple of years. I have tattoos, all right? Again, that's one of the things that they let slip for a few years and I think some people still think that they're, they're sort of fudging it a little bit. The Army tattoo policy is if you have any tattoos basically above your neck, below your wrist, or any type of uh, sexist, racist, anything like that, they are not going to waver that. It's just, you know, you may have the best kid in the world, all right? If he's 18 and he went and got a tattoo back over here, pretty much no matter what it is, unless he wants to get it removed, all right, they're not going to waver. All right, it's a huge deal now. Um, and part of that is because of a policy that came out about two years ago where they started taking pictures of everybody's tattoos because they had gotten so out of control and uh, it became a big deal. Um, so they kind of put it back to the rules that already existed. But again, anything above the neck or below the wrist or any type of sexist, racist, anything like that, it's pretty unlikely that they'll wait for that, okay? Uh, so once you find a recruiter, they determine that you're good to go, they'll send you to MEPS, Military Entry Processing Station. Do a physical exam, which you know, hearing, vision, you know, they make you do like the duck walk on the floor, your roars and stuff like that. It's a good time. Uh, there's a picture of a doctor right there. I pulled that off the Go Army website. I've been to Mets a few times, and I've never seen anything that was all happy like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that's at, but, but uh, and then you do the ASVAB exam. Uh, everybody kind of knows what the ASVAB is. It's a, it's a test. There's all kinds of stuff on it. At the end of the test, they give you a whole bunch of scores. One of those scores is a GT score. I put this up here because this is important for what I'm going to talk about later. To be a 91 Echo uh, in the United States Army, you only have to have a GT score of 92. That's really low. Okay, that's fine. You can get in. You can you can come be a welder. You can go to the schools. You can pass the flying colors. The problem is if you don't have at least a 110. Okay. You can't do anything else. 110 is a magic number that allows you to do other stuff, like go to warrant office program. Okay, so if they can't get a 110, they can still come in the Army. And I'm not saying, you know, they take the test, oh, I didn't get a 110, because usually they don't, they don't even tell you. Um, just be aware that if you have some somebody that's, you know, you're encouraging maybe to go to the military or something like that, if they don't get that 110, thing that they need to try to do is rectify that situation. There are ways to improve that score. That 110 is the magic number. Like apparently the Army takes it. You can get a 110, you're smart enough to do anything. I've seen plenty of people who got like 124 and they're covering a box of rocks. I mean, it is what it is. <coughs> uh, then they go to basic training if they meet all the requirements. And I think we all know what basic training is about. I don't know what it's like anymore. I went to basic training in 1997, so it is what it is. They still have drill sergeant round rounds. 
Um, I think it's a little harder now than it's been the last few years, so it is what it is. All right, uh, MOS 91 Echo. Uh, right here, these are all the enlisted ranks. Um, I used to be some of those. So back in the day, we used to have two different jobs, okay? We didn't have just 91 Echo Allied Train Specialist. We had two, 44 Bravo, 44 Echo. 44 Bravo Metal Worker, which is what I was when I started out, that's a welder. Then we had 44 Echo Machine. Well, about, oh, I'd say 12 years ago, uh, the Army started, for whatever reason, realizing that, hey, we got too many jobs. They started consolidating a lot of the ones. There was a time for about a year I was pretty sure that 44 Bravos and 44 Echoes were not for good, and that they were they were going to take mechanics, give them about two weeks of training on how to you know basically stick well, and uh, let them be, and just let them go to town. So that's that's a terrible idea. All right, so that got stopped. So the sort of the trade off was we merged the MOSs into 91 Echoes. So when your student comes in the army to be a 91 Echo, they're not just going to be a welder; they're also going to get trained. Um, historically, our training was conducted at Aberdeen Proving Grounds over the Oregon School. Well, they, they closed that down uh, and they built a huge new school in Fort Lee, Virginia. So now all the, all the training that's conducted for the Oregon School is now done in Fort Lee, Virginia at the Oregon Center School. Uh, 19 weeks, two days, that's the length of training for 91 Echo. Um, I wish it was a little longer, to be honest with you, but you know, it, that's the way the training was developed. Um, and again, students learned both, both welding and machining, that's why it's called Allied. Any questions on this? Please ask me a lot of questions. I don't think I can fill up the whole hour. I got a whole bunch of pictures. So. <laughs> uh, all right, so here's a picture of the school. It's kind of dated. Um, this is the new one at Fort Lee. They wiped out a whole bunch of training areas and built this monstrous school. Um, so back over here on the bottom, that is where all the barracks are. There's like, there's probably 20,000 privates in that area. So if you can imagine like 20,000-ish, 18 to 25-year-olds, the kind of crazy stuff that goes on over there. <laughs> but uh, this is the chow hall. And then uh, right here in this building on the bottom floor, that's where all the welding and machining training is conducted. Very, very nice facility. Um, I've only been there once when I went to Warren Officer Advanced Force in 2013. Very nice facility. I got a couple pictures here. Um, that's the front of the that's the front of the building right there. Um, so when they get there, the very first thing that they do is they do like a, you know your basic you know here's what welding is and here's how it works and this sort of thing. Before they do any kind of actual arc time, they get on the Vertex machine. Um, they have I think 12 of them. Um, the Army has saved yes, Vertex machines can be a little bit of money. The Army has saved a fortune in material and electro costs. A fortune. I asked. Uh, I asked the guy who runs it, I'm like, are, are these things really saving you money? He said, oh yeah, they're saving us money. So um, they put every single student through on the Vertex machine through each process before they ever learn how to touch a welding machine. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so here's a couple of pictures of the welding school area. Um, we're equal opportunity. You can see we got the Lincoln uh, exhaust, but we got a whole bunch of Miller machines in there. Got some Lincoln other stuff over here, but it, again, it's a really nice facility. The only thing they made a mistake on was this floor right here. I don't know why, it's some kind of tile, it's all ruined now. They're about to have to, they're about to, have to spend like 10,000 bucks to rip it all out. I don't know why they did that, it's a welding area. It doesn't make any sense. But the uh, number of boots, I can't say exactly, it's a bunch, all right? Uh, we do all the processes in there. It's a, it's a huge facility, very nice. Uh, okay, so. Just kind of take a look at this. You don't really have to understand it or, or know what it is, but it's our critical task list. So every few years, um, they come out and ask people like me and, and some of the NCOs and stuff. They say, hey, what do we need our welders to do in the field? All right, what are the most important things that we need them to know how to do? And that's how we come up with this critical task list. Once this is invented, all right, and approved and all that stuff, you've got to get staff, all right? That's how we come up with the training, okay? So we say, okay, we need to fabricate a workpiece from drawing your sketch. That's very important to us to be able to do. So we have to create our training based around that principle. Um, the 
you know, obvious stuff, well with, you know, she'll know our, she'll know, mm -hmm. she'll do metal arc welding. You know, we have to be able to do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So we come up with a curriculum based on, okay, we have to do these things. That's what this list is. This is the current list, it's about four years old, I think, we'll probably be redoing it here pretty soon. But this is how we come up with the training that we've done, right? So, this is AIT, Advanced Individual Training. That's where you go to learn how to do your job. Um, whether it's 11 Charlie, 11 Bravo, 91 Echo, um, this is what you do. Uh, 10 modules, 19 weeks, and two days. Don't have to go to two days for this one, it's always like that. Uh, so this is the order that they do things in, okay? Intro to machining, bench layout, lathe, milling, intro to welding, epoxy fuel, TIG, MIG, uh, stick welding, and then army rules. Um, the army and the marine corps use the same school, all the way up until the army unit portion. All right. At that time, the army people go this way, and the marines go over here, and they each do different stuff based on their service requirements. Um, we do welding on mild steel, aluminum, and stainless. Um, I asked a buddy of mine who's there for for MIG. They do short arc and they do spray. They don't do pulse for TIG. I don't know why. They probably should. Um, but, you, you know, one thing to keep in mind is if your student goes here, all right, they're already going to be advanced. Okay, they know how to do it. Um, most of the students that go through this school have no idea. They have never probably even touched a welding machine before in their life. You know? I had a kid one time that was from the inner city of Philadelphia that literally, he thought, corn just came in cans. He didn't know where it came from. He didn't think people farmed it anymore. He, never, he didn't know where it came from. All right? That's the sort of, you know, you never know who you're going to get at the Army. All right? So, uh, so it's really, it's kind of basic. I will tell you that if you send someone here from your school and they go to this training, they're going to be able to fast track with a lot of this. All right? So uh, school at like eight, all right? It depends where they're at in the module, okay? Um, so like the intro to machining, it says 23 hours. So that's gonna be, you know, probably, that's probably, you know, three or four days or something. Um, these 23 hours, 52 hours, it doesn't really mean a lot. Um, it does, because they have a very specific schedule, but, you know, if they're in the intro to machining, more than likely what they're, do, what they're gonna do is they're gonna come in, uh, they now give them all kinds of books. I believe they give them so they'll come in and they start going through, you know, death by PowerPoint, um, safety stuff, you know, what is a lathe, how does it work, what is a mill, how does it work, what are some of the tools, you know, safety, safety, safety again, don't wear your dog tags, you know, you don't wear long sleeves, I mean, it, you know. So when they get to the actual portion where they're actually starting to cut, you know, on the lathe or whatever, then they're going to be doing that, uh, lathe operation. 192 hours, that's probably like two weeks. Or something, all right? um, and that's all they do all day. All right, so kind of how you'll give a student like two coupons, you're like, here, you'll weld this up. And then you check it out, you're like, hey, slow down, speed up, you know, whatever the case may be. They're going to do the same thing with all of this, okay? Uh, whether it's the machinist portion or the welding portion. All right, they're, they're going to give them a work piece of, okay, here's a piece of steel. I want you to go turn it to this particular size. They'll do that, they'll come back, the instructor will check it, you know, help them out, they'll get another piece or whatever the case may be. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot to it, um, but yeah, they're not going to come in like in the morning and, and you know, do the hand and on, they can do book work or anything like that. It's really sort of where they're at in the module. But once they start cutting or welding, that's pretty much all they do. When they transition from like, a, say from TIG to MIG or something like that, they'll probably go in the classroom, you know, for a few hours or something basic understanding of it. But after that, they'll be in the, they'll be in the school.
So if you're a really good welder, right? Obviously you do all the mill stuff first. Um, when I was in AIT many years ago, we had a dude that had been welding for a long time. Well he, depending on your speed, so that you're able to complete the projects and take the tests, um, you can go forward to the next class. There are factors involved. Where's that class at? Where's your class at? Stuff like that. But if you, you know, if, if it's instantaneous, if it's instantly sort of, you know, if it's obvious that you are a really good stick loader and you can take the test on day three, they may allow you to do that. Okay, that's really important to Yeah, all the machines are there. In the AIT, it's going to be manual laser mill. It's not going to be CNC. I know I have an awesome picture of CNC. That's, that's my buddy and, and uh, one of my training with industry predecessors over there. Um, one of the advanced courses in 2013. So, any more questions on this? And then, our, actually, Army Unique. So, Army Unique, once they do all this, like I said, the Marines and the Army, they share the same school, they do all the same stuff. The Army Unique portion, they break off. The Army does. The Marines actually teach their branding people how to do CNC. The Army doesn't do it. All right. um, I, I'm hoping that they're going to, but they haven't. Done it. <laughs> so they get uh, training on a welding trailer and some other stuff that the Army has deemed is important for them to know. Um, it, 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 like like really, it changes. Quite like a actually on piece of equipment type thing. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute of our welding trailer. But inside the school, they have like 20 of them lined up. So they actually go out there and they give them some material and then they force them to use that, that equipment, you know, take the tools off, use it, set it up and all that stuff. A big problem we had in the past is people would come out of school, they had no idea how to set up anything. You know, because yep. you walk in the booth, you know, okay, let me pull down my exhaust right here, I got my piece of metal, I turn the machine on, maybe I turn it off and I'm, I'm welding, you know. So they actually make them go in there for a while and, and weld off that welding trailer and make sure that they know. Uh, mild steel, aluminum, and stainless. Uh, we do all those. And again, uh, lay the mill or manual. Um, no CNC until you go back for a later higher school. Right. Any more questions on this? Or? All right, so we finally have certification. All right, it took years and years and years of effort. NIM certifications for machining. I can pretty much tell you every student that comes out has measurement materials and safety. That's really easy. All right, let's face it. You know, how do you use earplugs and stuff like that? It's, it's not hard. All right, how do you use a dial caliber? How do you use a tape measure? For these NIM certification, oh, for these NIM certification, all right, that's all the machinist stuff. Okay, that's your lathe, your mill, drill press. They're able to get level one credentials for those items. Um, there's a hands-on performance test, so they give you a print, and you gotta cut a part, all right, to whatever the spec of the print. Um, and then there's a computer-based test, a, you know, sort of a general knowledge test that you have to do. I'll tell you, I've taken those tests, they're not easy, all right? They're pretty hard, actually, so. Um, but it's free, all right? It took years, the Army paid for it, each and every one. Um, it took many years, and I'm very happy to say that we're finally doing it. All right, I have four or five that I got when I, the last time I was there. Made a certification. All right. Again, it's free. If they're really good at now, if they're not too good at what they're doing, if they're not very good at you know cutting parts on the lathe, the instructors aren't going to pay for it. Okay, I mean, it's pointless for the army to pay for a certification that we already know. So it's really for the <coughs> excuse me. And we finally have AWS certifications. We actually got the NIM certifications first. Finally, we're doing AWS certifications for welding. Alright. So during a the class, they can get certificates for four welding processes and one cutting. Alright, from AWS. These are the ones they can get. Um, they, they estimate about 500 per year. I don't know how many are actually getting AWS certifications. So your welding teacher, if your student goes there and they're not certified, or maybe your school is not certified to give AWS certifications, then this might be a good way to get free certification. Okay. 
can do it right there in the school. There's other ways I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes. But I mean, they can get them right there in the school. So maybe they don't want to get out of school super fast. Maybe they want to practice and try to get some of these certifications. All right, because if, if, the, if the module they're doing is two weeks and they're kind of done with everything in four days, well, then they got all the rest of that time to practice to do a certification for free. All right. I'm very, very, very glad that we're finally doing this. It was just, we, we, we tried for many, many years to get it. It was very difficult. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't know that there's voters in the army. So this is one thing we can say, you know, we're legit. We're giving you AWS certification. We're giving you new certifications, all right? We're doing the right thing. Excuse me. All right, so I told you I have a lot of pictures. They're about to start. Uh, this is our welding trailer, okay? It's called Shop Equipment Welding. Um, it's been out since probably about 2000, I guess. Uh, it replaced a old um, Hobart trailer. Um, the ones that they use at school, they have a plastic shell, which has turned out to be a disaster. They've since, many of them have since been replaced with aluminum. Um, you can see the, it's kind of weird if, if you can see it, but the roof comes up. So you got to kind of lift it up. You open the doors. There's a military trailblazer inside. There's a hot box that nobody ever uses because you have to be plugged in. Um, it's got some helmets and stuff, but this is the setup in the actual school of one of the trailers. Okay, so when they go to that RV unique portion, this is one of the things they come to do. They take them in here. They're like, okay, there's your trailer, private snuffy. Um, here's all your stuff. They have to inventory it. They have to sign for it, which is something that's really important in the military. You gotta sign for everything. Um, and then they gotta set it up and they gotta use it. All right, these trailblazers are really loud. So that room, the first time I went in there, I opened the door and I blew my eardrums out. All right, so they're already using their ear protection stuff. But they force them to use the trailer so that they know how to use it. They can set up the stick, they can set up the rig, they can set up the pig without somebody having to Here's another picture of it. Um, all the tools kind of go in these boxes right here. Somebody decided these little, you know, sterilite totes were a good idea to put in, like some of the cables, the air arc stuff, and stuff like that. They always get destroyed, but they're cutting bugs for a place, you know. So, uh, but has all the tools. There's an air compressor inside. The newer ones have plasma cutters in them. Uh, this is an old picture because it's got this propylene bottle. We got rid of that after about five minutes. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got one of the first ones. All right, so we sent that propylene bottle out to get it filled. People are like, well, we never use it. Let's try it out. So we got it back. I was like, you can't even cut with this. I don't know. So we just took it out. I took out the whole bracket and everything I put in the bottle. So, but yeah, all the sides open up. Got all your tools inside. Um, it's pretty small. Um, easy to tell. You tell it behind like a two and a half ton truck. So that is our wonderful shop equipment welding. Hopefully, this thing will be going away or at least getting augmented by this in the very near future. You can read this, um, but it's coming out soon, as they keep saying. It's called the MWMSS, all right? So right here, all right, these trucks, they're called LHSs. Or no, these are actually field axles. they got triple axle. Oh, yeah. So there's type one and type two. Type one is one box, type two is both boxes, all right? This is the easy way to transport them, these, these PLSs. Um, on the back, they got a big hydraulic hook, comes down, hooks onto that thing, and pulls it on up. I got a pretty good picture for you of a mishap with one of these right here in a minute. Um, so this is a welding of machine shop in a box. It's beautiful. I can't wait to see one. For the last four years, they've been saying we're going to get them. But they keep cutting money. They keep cutting money. There's some kind of plan. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, beginning stages being fielded, supposedly a couple guys have got, but I, I don't really believe that. Basically, the way it works is, uh, depending on your type of unit, if you have one of me, an Allied Trade Warrant Officer, you get it to both boxes. So you get a CNC link, and if you're kind of out there by yourself, and it's just like a sergeant and a private or something like that, you only get to get the one box that's got the link in it. All right. It's going to have a torch make. Like I said, all the CNC stuff. Uh, there's a quarter band. There's all kinds of awesome tools in there. They got a, a nitrogen collector thing, so you can fill your nitrogen bottles somehow. And it's got all kinds of cool stuff. Um, hopefully, I will get one someday. Maybe I'll be right back. Are you going to have a fill your fuel tanks, or are you going to fill right up to the east? Oh, so it's a separate bolt, so a whole generator? No, no, the generator's inside. Uh, oh, okay. 
this, uh, I think these ones are supposed to have a hood. The Army has a billion generators, so, yeah. And then, you know, the 30K generators, we probably run it, I don't know, 15, 16 hours, probably on the day. So, but you know, it's the Army, we carry fuel cans and we run the boat. Yeah, it's all self-contained. You know, at nighttime, it probably becomes a bedroom. So, when you're out in the field, you want to see what's in it. But yeah, it's supposed to be a really nice system. Again, maybe they'll get them out before I retire. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so AIT is over. The kids went in. They joined the Army. They went to boot camp. Uh, they went to Fort Lee. They did private stuff at Fort Lee. They learned how to weld and they learned how to machine. So now they're getting ready to go out to the regular Army. All right, so what's it like? Well, they're going to get a duty station. All right, it doesn't matter where they want to go. So normally what happens is at MEPS, somebody there will be like, hey, give me your top three locations you would like to go. Generally, they don't know where all the duty stations are at. So they're going to write like, you know, Dallas, Texas or, you know, Cleveland, Ohio or whatever. So there's no base in Dallas, Texas or Cleveland, Ohio or, or anywhere like that. So what they try to do is if you say, okay, my, my number one choice is Dallas, Texas. Okay, then you might have a chance to go to Fort Lee. But there's no guarantee. Right? That's just the way it is. There's no guarantee. Um, generally, when people go to MEPS, they will have, they, they may walk out of MEPS with orders to go to a duty station. They may get them a little later. Either way, uh, in my experience, I'd say at least half of them get changed by the time they leave AIT. They'll get orders for Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and two days before they leave AIT, they get a new set of orders, send them in. In my experience, I would say 80% of people who come in the Army and get stationed nearby to where they're from hate it. That's just the way it is. Um, because you, know, you come in the Army, you go to basic training, do all this stuff, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm from San Antonio. Let me get to Fort Hood. All right, so they go to Fort Hood. So they go back to San Antonio, and all their buddies in San Antonio, you know, they're still out there acting like 18, 19 year olds. You know? they, they no longer have any connection with them. Mom and dad expects them to come home every other day. They can't do it. They want to go out with their friends and do other stuff. You know, so, you know, if you really have someone that's coming to the military, they're going to they're gonna want to do whatever they want to do. Fort Hood, Texas is a really easy place to go to, all right? But it's a bad place to go if you're from Texas because nobody ever likes it, you know? Like I said, mom and dad, they always want you home every day. It's crazy. Kids, they never like it, all right? They never like it. But at the same time, they go far away, and they're like, ah, oh, I wish I was close to home. And they get close to home on the next duty station, and guess what? They don't like it. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, here's a map that's got mostly Army installations. I put stars next to some of the bigger ones where people are likely to get stationed. I have had a sergeant that went to White Sands Missile Range. Only Army welder I've ever heard of even being there. I don't know what he was doing there. Okay? That... My point to say that is, you can go anywhere, all right? You're probably not going to. You're probably gonna go to Fort Lewis, Fort Carson, Fort Hood, Fort Bragg is a huge one, uh, Fort Campbell, you know, some of the big ones, all right? But this is just United States installations where people are likely to go. Um, I'm from Wyoming, you can see a terrible absence of duty stations around this area. It is what it is, you know, it never bothered me. But, uh, you know, so, you can go pretty much anywhere, Alaska, Hawaii, and then of course this doesn't even count any of the overseas assignments. What, right? what do the stars stand for? Uh, all it is is just, that's me saying, these are big installations, pretty good chance that if you join the Army tomorrow, those are your, probably your most you're probably going to go to one of those places. You may not. You may go to White Sands Missile Range or, uh, you know, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Fort Gordon is nothing but signal stuff, you know, computer geeks and stuff. But there's got to be a unit there maintaining some kind of truck or something. So there's probably a couple welders there. So they may go there. It's not very likely, though. 
more than likely, they'll probably get a woman in the right. Fort Hood is like 40,000 active duty. Um, Fort Bragg is pretty close to being that size. Fort Stewart is huge. All right. They're really big places. They have a ton of units. Uh, a lot of times, if they have nowhere else to send you, they'll just send you to one of those places, knowing that that installation will find one. So. All right. Uh, here's some pictures. Places I've been, things I've done. Uh, that's in Texas at Fort Hood. Good time with our records. Uh, down here, that's me probably 15 years ago or so at Fort Irwin, California at the National Training Center. That's a buddy of mine. Uh, that's the last time I was in Iraq. And this is a picture of the DMZ in Korea facing the North Korea side. So that building right there is actually North Korea. And this dude right here is making sure that they stay over there. <laughs> And I will tell you, when you get off the bus, if you look across, there'll be a whole group, a whole bunch of North Koreans, and all of them are looking at you with binoculars. When you get off the bus, it's it's something. You can actually go stand next to these South Korean uh, soldiers. I mean, you could try to push them or whatever; they'll probably kill you. But, um, you can stand next to them. You can do whatever. They will not. It's, it's they are they are very disciplined. Uh, and then the top picture you can't really see it because the lighting. That's a picture of the Northern Lights. My last duty station was Alaska. Um, I took that picture about a year ago. So everybody likes Alaska. They always want to ask me about it, so I have some more pictures from Alaska. <laughs> <coughs> uh, last year, actually, uh, heck, it was just back in March, uh, they started the Iditarod from Fairbanks because um, Anchorage had no snow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, down here, that's... Uh, that's not me, but it's one of my classmates at the Northern Warfare Training Center. Went out there to do a cold weather class. Basically, you go out and stay out in the freezing cold for many days and learn how to do it. That's pretty much what it's all about. Um, here's a cool picture. We're in the field, I think it was last year. And we're doing some sling load training. So you got a, a Chinook helicopter carrying a Humvee that just kept picking it up and moving it around. Um, that picture right there is on Harding Lake. See the ice auger right there. We're out there trying to catch some lake trout and catch some rain. All right, there's no way that truck was falling through that ice. That ice at that point. That was this spring, so it was probably about three foot thick. All right, we never caught any lake trout. I was kind of mad. And then the bottom picture was taken about noon um, during the cold weather class. This is the last day. Of Pretty cool. All right, so what do we do in the Army? We fix, fabricate stuff, solve problems. All right, that's one thing I've learned over the years. I'm a problem solver. I have seen more stuff broke in the oddest way than you can possibly imagine. I mean, soldiers, if, if, if there's a thing that can be broke, they will find a way to break it. And they'll find a way to break it at the most inopportune time, in the most inopportune place, in the craziest situation you can uh, again, milestone aluminum is mostly what we deal with, also some stainless, um, really any type of material. I say any type, but um, Carl Peters at Lincoln Electric, I was a, I had him sign a memo for me, I said all types of materials, and he was like, gold? You know, you can't weld gold, that's okay. So I don't do all types of material, we do most types. Um, so this picture right here, that is a, some kind of a pulley off of a water purification system, so we machined a new one. Um, this is an old picture, it's kind of goofy, but this uh, gun mount right here, back in 2003 in Iraq, we were not necessarily prepared for everything. So uh, we started making these gun trucks, but we didn't have any gun mounts. So I didn't have a very good shop set at the time, but I did what I could do, and I, I made a few of these gun mounts. So that's, that's the picture right there. Um, okay, so right here, that is a homemade tap that a buddy of mine did. Place in Fort Irwin, California. He has a heat treatment oven, so he's able to pull it off. Um, this picture is kind of dark. It's kind of hard to see. This is not one of my projects, but I thought it was really cool. Somebody did a lot of research, spent a lot of time, and made a load test set. So, any type of hydraulic equipment, forklifts, cranes, whatever, it's got to be load tested, you know, at least annually. So, he came up with this plate system. This, this lifting apparatus to where he can pull those plates off to a known weight 
and then do the load thing. All right. He I, he spent a lot of time, a lot of effort to do it. I think it's a really cool project. I wish I thought of it myself. Um, these two guys right here, that's a that's an axle lamp, I believe, or a trailer. All right. So they made that. That's a picture of me back in the day. I'm fixing some kind of landing weight. Uh, one of my Joes in Alaska. He's making a frame. I think that's probably a toolbox rack. And then uh, we do a lot of trophies, all right? Metal workers are artists. Um, cut this out on a plasma table. And then uh, this little wolf right here, I actually cut it out to where you pulled it out and bent it back so it gives like a 3D effect. And then we found a, a really good uh, artist who did all the, uh, the airbrushing on that thing. I normally really hate doing trophies, all right? With a few exceptions, which I'll, I'll show you in a couple minutes. But it's part of what we do. We do do a lot of trophies. Most people don't have don't mind doing them because want to keep you engaged doing something. Because um, the army likes to uh, change a lot of parts, they like to fix a lot of things. So sometimes it's kind of kind of hard to break through that. So we do a lot of trophies to, to sort of stay relevant. Plus people like it. Um, service and recovery section. The reason I point that out is because if you come in the army as a welder and you go to a BCP or B service and recovery section, you're going to be on a record. All right, at some point. I spent a lot of time on. So that's why I have this picture right here, which is a water purification system, the same type that pulley came off of. And the truck is that same type of truck I was talking about earlier, all right? Well, you can plainly see that the truck and this thing are not in line with each other. This, <laughs> this, this thing is really, really heavy too, man. So what happened is this, is this is in Korea, and so they were purifying water out of a river. Well, during monsoon season, this river is much fuller than it normally is. So all these rocks is basically the riverbed. So they, when this thing, you know, when it starts to lift up, it kind of goes like this. Right? It goes at an angle, and the, the truck can pull it this way, or you know, you can just let all the brake and put the truck in neutral, and the weight of the box, whatever you're picking up, will pull the truck back. Well, this guy wasn't smart enough to do that. So he was dragging the water purification system, all these giant rocks, all right. So when it got up to the truck and it got up to the rollers. One whole side was just, it had a pile of rocks in front of it. So they started lifting it up and the whole thing fell off the side. The only thing that kept it from flipping over is on the other side where you can't see right now, it's sitting on the two tires. Yeah, that's the only thing that kept it from flipping over. All right, and there's one of my guys using a plasma cutter. I don't know what he was making. And then uh, there's a picture of me, that's probably 06. I think that's, yeah, we're making the mine roller. Excuse me. All right. So, all right. They're welders. They're doing stuff. They're doing great things for their country. Welding all kinds of stuff and fixing things, solving problems. So, what are some of the things that they can do while they're in the service? Okay. And I'm, I'm going to kind of go through the whole thing. If they want to get out in four years or whatever, or if they want to stay in for a career like I'm doing. Um, everybody knows educational programs. Um, you have the college loan repayment or the post 9 11 GI Bill. So, if they have college loans, Not get the GI Bill. Okay, the college loan repayment, in my opinion, is it's a good deal for the Army. It's kind of a scam, right? Because the Army will pay 100% of your college loan over time, so they will pay, in a, but it doesn't include any type of interest. So if you had $100,000, okay, year one they'll pay 33,000. still have to cover the interest, okay? It's important to know about that. I actually didn't know that because I never cared about it. Um, I talked to a recruiter recently, and he's the one who told me that. I didn't know that. So, that's important. <coughs> so, post 9-11 GI Bill, much better than the uh, Montgomery GI Bill. Um, and so you can do either one. Uh, tuition assistance. So, I've had all kinds of kids in the Army tell, I don't have time to take college classes, blah, blah, blah. This is from my record. Associate degree in general studies that I got from Central Texas College in 2011, and a bachelor's degree in organizational management I got from Ashland University. I just finished this year. I have never paid for a college class. All right, I've done all of that with tuition assistance. I wish I'd have done it when I was like 22, but I didn't. You know, I waited for many years. Big mistake, but I, you 
Army Cool Credentialing Opportunities Online. Um, basically, this is a way, so like, uh, say that they got uh, AWS certification in AIT, um, but they want to get some more, okay? This cool program, and I've never used it, but I've known a couple people who have, you can go on there, and basically what it does is it provides you a sort of a path to be able to, while you're in the service, go get another certification, all right? And as long as you go through this, you can get a pay for it by the military. So I've never used it. I, don't, I know they do all this. CWE, CWI is on there. Um, ASC certifications, NIMS. Um, it can be done. I've known people who've done it. I personally have never done it. So I can't really speak to how easy or hard it is, but I don't think it's that difficult. Um, if they want to stay in for a really long time and they don't like being a welder, they don't like being enlisted, whatever the case may be, they can do green to gold. That's what they go you get out of the Army, you go to college, the Army pays you while you're in college, and you come out as an officer as a lieutenant. Um, you can do the Warrant Officer Program, that's what I did. You can do Training with Infantry, which is what I did. That's kind of the stuff that welders can do. There's other things you can do. Um, I didn't really want to talk about things that I haven't done, and I don't know a lot about, um, because, you know, that would be kind of pointless. So, these are things that you can do if you want to stay in for a really long time. Everybody can use TA after I believe Everybody gets a GI Bill. Okay? Everybody can use this cool. Right? So, and that's what all you pretty much all you have to do is join, and you can use those programs. Green to gold, more officer stuff like that. It takes a little longer. Right? You, you working on a career at that time. So, more officer program. That's what I did. My 14 Alpha. These are kind of the prerequisites for it. Um, Basically, the important thing is to see minimum of 60 months experience uh, documented by NCOVR. So that's five years, right? You're not even going to be an NCO to get an NCOVR until you've been in the Army probably at least three years or so. Right? So generally, warrant officers, or you submit a warrant, a warrant packet around the six to ten year mark. All right? It used to be a little bit higher. I think they're trying to get a little, a little bit more time out of us now. And so they try to get a little I don't really think that's the case for my field because, as, as we all know, uh, you can't just learn how to weld every day. It takes a lot of experience. Okay. Uh, and then they just started this thing with the the college level English. I don't know what that's all about. It's one of the prereqs, though. But if they're going in at this point, they've already figured it out. Warren Officer Candidate School. There's a couple of happy little pictures. That's my class. In December 2007, that's where you do all your training at, is Fort Worth Hall. Um, but it's not really a very happy course. It's kind of like basic training on steroids. And essentially, the whole thing is when you go to Warren Officer Candidate School, it's a lot of physical stuff, but it's more mental because they're trying to see if you can work as a team. So they purposely get the class kind of doing a lot of team fighting and stuff. So it just makes it really crappy for seven weeks. But it's not that hard. I was a distinguished honor graduate. I mean, I'm a welder. You know, everybody's like, oh, you're just a welder. Swing a hammer and you know, fire a torch out. You know? Okay. Training with industry. That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, my duty station right now is Lincoln Electric. All right, in Cleveland. Okay. Very, very difficult program to get into. Um, here is the Army's definition of it. Uh, highly competitive application process. Again, you're going to have to be in the Army for a long time to even think about doing it. Um, and for every single day that I'm at Lincoln Electric, I owe the Army three more days. All right? So I started in August. I'll get done next August. And uh, even though I've been in you know, for a long time, I probably can't retire for another four or five years. Right? But 
that's a unique opportunity. Uh, you submit an application, a whole bunch of high rollers report them, you take a look at all the applications, Lincoln takes a look at the applications, and uh, based on other factors, they select the most qualified candidate. And uh, so it's me and one other guy that's there, at NCO. And uh, the theory is I go to Lincoln, I learn everything I can learn uh, from all the smart people there, and I take that back to the benefit of the military. I will tell you that get to where I'm at, you have to be pretty damn good as well in the Army. You know? So I got to Lincoln, I'm like, man, I'm pretty smart. Man, there's people at Lincoln Electric that have forgotten more stuff about welding than I probably know. You know it, it's amazing, the knowledge. Um, if you ever get a chance to, to do one of the Blodgett seminars from Dwayne Miller, even if you're not like a structural engineer or something like that, it's amazing. You know, because he, I sat through one of them, and he was talking about things that I had known from trial and error, but you have no like, so I, you know, I didn't really have this sort of uh, scientific background or reasoning why. It's amazing, uh, just great people there. I've had a really good time so far. This is a picture of me and my boys. Um, they had a family day over there. So they took him in, let him weld up a little, uh, little eagle thing. It was pretty cool, so. So that is my duty station for a year. And that's why I'm here at the show. <laughs> All right, so when you get out, okay, post-service opportunity. This could be whether you do two years or 22 years, all right? CareerOneStop.org, it's basically just a job search site. Um, in 2006, I said, you know what? I can't take this army anymore. I'm getting out. All right, I'm done. I hate it. So I was on that side a lot, all right? Here I am today, so I guess it is what it is. <laughs> uh, Homeless to hard hats, that's a big deal. A lot of people like it, does a lot of job training, it does welding training, you know, among other things. All right, so you can use your GI Bill to pay for some of that. Um, apparently in the past, this talk has kind of been about comes to hard hats. Um, I've known a few people who did it. Um, my brother-in-law did it when he got kicked out of the army. He, was, he didn't do some stuff right, so he got kicked out. He used this program and he's doing all right. So uh, the big deal right now is the VIP program. UA is doing. So here's the way it works. Say you're stationed in Fort Hood, Texas. All right. UA has a facility on post if you're about to get out and they do training. They do welder training. They do uh, you know, pipe fitters. They do plumbers. They do electrical stuff, some other things. And they will give you training for free on post. Um, if you, whether you're a vet or you're just about to get out. Um, it's a big deal. DOD's big into it. Um, what I understand, it's a great program. It's all free. Um, so, you know, that's one of the options that you have. <coughs> Excuse me. ACAP, everybody in the Army, when they get out, they have to do ACAP. All right. So, basically, what that is, is they bring you in, they teach you how to write a resume, do interviews, that sort of thing. All right. Everybody has to do it. Um, part of that, though, is there's a lot of job fairs. And I'm, I mean, I've seen every kind of employer. Anything, anybody you can think of that's looking for, for qualified, you know, hardworking people, they will come to these job fairs and try to hire people. Um, so it's a good opportunity. You don't even have to be getting out. You know, a lot of guys are getting ready to retire, or maybe they have you know a couple of years to go or something. You go to these job fairs, you can start making a lot of connections with people. Uh, post 9/11 GI Bill. The beautiful thing about the post 9/11 GI Bill is if you're not going to use it, you can transfer it to your family. All right. Didn't used to be that way. To me, that's the big, that's the big deal about it. Um, but you can't use it for licensing and certification tests, all right? Like on that cool, you could use a portion of it to do some uh, AWS search or NIMS search or something like that, pay for a CWI um, seminar and exam or, or something like that. They'll pay up to $2,000 per test. Um, and then, of course, you know, if, if they want to get out and just go do regular follow-up for whatever reason, you can be able to do that. And from my understanding, you actually make quite a lot of money from the GI Bill while you're in school. So um, then there's DOD Skill Bridge, and that kind of links back to the VIP program and, and how much the hard hats, and that sort of brings a lot of those programs that are out there that are, that are legit into one place. All right, so that's that's a website that you can go to and, and see some of those programs. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what it's all about, though. 
Everybody comes in the military for different reasons. Um, people ask me why I join the Army. I don't know. I think it's to get away from where I was from. I, I really don't know. You know, most people say, oh, I love my country. Well, that's not what you probably join for money or something. But whatever the reason is, once you've been doing it for a little while, you know, you get all the camaraderie built up. This is a picture from the last time I was in Iraq. That's my company. That's me right there standing up on the 88. And, uh, you know, I still talk to some of these people. And, you know, if I came across them today, I would know them. All right? and, uh, so no matter what the reason that you joined the Army, no matter what you ended up doing, um, this is what it's all about, being part of the team. All right, so I talked about trophies earlier. Today's Veterans Day. I did not know this hero right here, but I did make this flag stand right here. So he got killed in Baghdad. This is 2006. And so his supervisor came to me and said, hey, we just had this soldier that got killed. Um, we want you to make a, a guide on stand. And the, the, the shape is the airborne thing, all right? So I don't like giving trophies, like I said. So I made this for him. Um, you can't really see it in the picture, but the way we did it is on the parachute, each of the lines is actually cut out. So there's, there's no metal there. It's not just painted. The wings, we actually them out um, on each of the lines, and the same thing with the wreath and the star. And it was a lot of work, and we finished it in like two days because we're, we're fixing to have this, uh, this ceremony for the All right, so even though I hate doing trophies, sometimes, you know, when you get something like this, it's a great honor to do. Today's Veterans Day. Um, I couldn't ever solicit for you guys or anyone else to give money to any particular organization. However, as a private citizen, I would ask that if you should desire to give money to a charitable organization in the name of veterans, um, these are some good ones right here, okay? There's some ones out there that are not so great, um, but again, I can't, you know, advise you either way. Amazon Smile, very easy way to support these charities. All you got to do is go to smile.amazon.com, choose a charity, whatever it is. It could be, you know, the Rocky Mountain. And so every time you make a purchase on Amazon, a portion of that goes to whatever your charity is. I support the Fisher House. Um, Fisher House is on many military installations, VA hospitals and stuff. And when people are sick or whatever the case may be, they, they, they help the families. You know, if they don't have enough money to travel or, or have a place to stay, they, they put them up and stuff like that. So that's a really good one. That's the one that my Amazon Smile money goes to, and I just thought I'd pass that along. Um, and that's pretty much it. Here's my information. I don't like giving out my personal cell phone number. Uh, you can get me at Lincoln Electric until August of next year, but that's my email address. There are some of the websites for some of the stuff I talked about. Um, so that's it.